Okay. I think I've uh, been given the official signal to um, start here. So I will do that and feel free to take your seats and drink your coffee. And I've already said that um, I think it's fine if I just sort of introduce myself <laughs> because um, it's my favorite kind of talk where I'm going to talk a lot about myself anyway. So you're going to learn um, more about me than you see just sort of up here on the screen, the obligatory you know, title of the talk and where I'm from and all of that. I hope we can go a little deeper. And I'd just like to say, first of all, I'm so happy to be here. And by here, I mean like literally here in person in a room together. And I'm so appreciative for Alan for setting us up with remembering you know, what it is to be in a material space with others breathing the same air and sharing our own cooperative energies. It's, it's, you know, something I don't think I will ever take for granted again after the past couple of years that we've had, but something, um, you know, I hope you are all, all feeling the excitement and the energy from because I can feel it out there and I know it's been two years since you've been able to do that. And one of the, um, sort of themes is, has been expressed is sort of this, how are we recovering? What is our future, where are we going forward, and can we be hopeful and joyful about, um, you know, this here-ness that we have now, and what does it mean to be here, and thinking about the future, and all of that together. So I hope I will address that, and therefore, I hope I don't throw you off with my title. <laughs> it's games are trouble. Let's just start with the, <laughs> let's just start with the negative. Um, but then you can see my parentheses, um, which shows that, but that's not the end of the story. So I do want to tell a troubled tale, and I do want to tell a troubled story. Um, and I'm very much going to talk about stories. Uh, so again, I love the way this was so perfectly set up with Alan to talk about, you know, what are the stories we have and how do we express them and how do we tell them? But um, I, I, I want to do that in an honest way, which is not to set up some kind of potential progress narrative that leads us to a perfect future, um, but that also doesn't not lead us to a perfect future because you know, when I say that games are trouble, I do mean they're deep trouble. Um, it's systemically, historically, um, politically, <laughs> socially, culturally, educationally, you know, and all of the other lees you can think of, we can pile on to say games are, are, are trouble. So you can just keep, keep going with that. But, you know, the fact of the matter is it's, it's not over yet. And as I say, it's not the end of the story, um, which, as I said, doesn't mean I'm going to give you a happily ever after here. I don't want a fairy tale, but I do sort of want a fairy tale. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm struck in that mix of I don't want to give you a classical fairy tale, but I want to talk about fairy tales and what that means. Um, and when I say it's not over yet, that doesn't mean because it's not possible um, sometimes. And it's not because it's not already potentially or partially possible and it's evident and realized and emergent as we go and as we're here and as we're, you know, in the space together. But it's, as I said, we're not there yet because we're not there yet. It's, it's not over. Um, and it never really can be because we're always going to be in process right? The, you know, these kind of teleological endings where we say, and now it's over, are, you know, false for us. We're always in process, and we're always going, and we're always breathing, and we're always experiencing, and we're always unfolding. And so, for that reason, I believe that games are trouble, but that we also then have to be um, vigilant. We have to be open, and we have to be receptive and responsive, and we have to position ourselves sort of in that unfolding and in that entangling. And we have to um, seek and resist and we have to be accepting and embracing and all of those other ings and all of those things that are ongoing, the doing and the making and the telling um, and the designing 
and everything else you can imagine in that list. And if I told you to take five seconds to think of more ings, you could think of what they would be. Um, but as I said, I want us to keep in process and I want us to think about that. Um, how do we tell a story that's an ongoing story where we don't falsify our endings, um, but yet we're also um, not necessarily apocalyptic or cryptic or um, it doesn't have to be a horror story in order to be a fairy tale. So as I said, the information is on the screen about me and where I come from in the University of Huevda in a development, a game development program, rather, in a school of informatics, the University of Huevda in Sweden, and all of those I'll embed in there. But I do think they're sort of important facts uh, to, to center this talk, that where I'm from and the context from where I speak and where I work and where I teach is super um, significant to me um, to think about. So um, I also... Um, want to say that um, some of the reflections that I'm going to be sharing today, uh, the, the ones that come a little bit later that I'm setting up now, but that I'll go into more detail, um, that are the reflections on the trouble with games and troubled games and troubling games, are more fully elaborated on in a, a paper that I published this year with my co-author and my colleague, uh, Rebecca Rouse in the journal Convergence. Um, the article is called Troubling Games, so you can see my inspiration, Materials, Histories, and Speculative Worlds of Games Pedagogy. So um, if you want to, you can go there and you'll get more detail because of course I don't have time to go through some of the sort of deeper um, sources into this and I'm sort of gonna have to skim the surface a little bit and there are other things I also wanna talk about, but it is available. Um, Open, open access. So um, that's the context for the article that I'll come back to. Um, but, you know, sort of here's where we began and here was the inspiration for us working together and writing together. Uh, as both of us are faculty members, as I said, in a game development education, a large education, which I'll share more details about, um, both as researchers, teachers, and humans, um, we are very aware of the many deep troubles uh, within games education and curricula. And uh, today, that's the hat that I'm wearing. I'm the researcher, teacher, and the human. There are lots of other hats um, that, that we can wear, but that's the one that I sort of want to center in and focus on. Um, because as I said, Rebecca and I together were inspired to write this um, article after lots of conversation about our own programs, our own context, and where we came from, and sort of thinking again, like, why, why are we here? What are we doing, and how did we get here? Um, and so, as I said, we're very aware of the many deep troubles within these, because we are aware of the deep troubles sort of in the world. <laughs> Obviously, um, the games troubles and world troubles are interconnected, and many of the problems that we ascribe and that I'll ascribe today to games are just, they're problems of the world. And we, we can't not think about that interrelationship, which doesn't mean that we don't have to think more deeply about the connections between them. But I'm not trying to isolate and say, you know, games are this special troubled thing and everything else is good. <laughs> so, and I'm also not trying to say that everything else is just completely a mess, um, but maybe it is, and maybe that's the way it has to be. So we have to start there. Um, so I go back to saying games are trouble, the world is trouble, and clearly the world is in trouble. Um, but that doesn't mean, um, as I said, that we have to end there. Um, and I believe, as we heard earlier, that we can look at the ways that the world and games um, intervene in unique, magical, and in dark kinds of ways. Um, the dark arts, as you can see here with my, my cauldron. Um, so we have to go to the cauldron and we have to go to the fix and I'm going to talk about the, um, the cauldron and the inspiration in that in a bit and the fire. Um, but I'm now going back to thinking about my inspiration and thinking about games and uh, sort of how we came to, to know them. And um, for Rebecca and I, as we were considering this relationship, um, we believe that we sort of identify in our relationship to games and sometimes to the world as both insiders and as outsiders um, at the, the same time. Sort of given our status as queer women in a male-dominated field, um, the games field, 
um, both also with an interdisciplinary um, arts, tech, humanities um, backgrounds, as opposed to sort of the pure STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, um, which is often associated with, has a long legacy, which I'll un unpack in, in just a bit. Um, we often feel, and we again, I'm talking about Rebecca and I, but I'm sure some of you can share this, this feeling that we are the ones who are commonly tasked with trying to fix the kinds of troubles that are the troubles with games and the things that I'll um, talk about later. So for, for an example of that, you know, I um, am often identified as one of the faculty members who can speak to our game students. And again, we have a large games education in our first year we have a course that's like a game analysis course where we introduce them to lots of sort of theoretical concepts in the first or second semester. I think we moved this now to the second semester. Just of how do you think critically and theoretically about games? And I'm often the person who sort of stands up and gives the first gender and games lecture or lectures about representation and diversity and, and inclusion and how those work. And um, I'm very happy that that's a task and a role that I've sort of assumed in my seven years or so being in but it's also sometimes a very isolating role. It can feel very sort of tokenism in the fact that I stand up there sort of by myself and, and we mark out this important time that we, you know, we introduce this to the students and we introduce it early, but it isn't always sort of picked up on and followed up on in deep ways. We're trying and we've changed the way that, that we sort of do that and we're struggling, but it's very hard to keep those important issues and momentum. And I do have to say that in the sort of seven years or so that I've been talking about these issues to my game students, that I can feel the context and the background is shifting and changing and becoming more uh, receptive to, to think. So why do we have to think about these issues of identity and inclusion? And we have to think about things like, you know, racism and ableism and um, fascist aesthetics and colonial, um, design and, uh, and all of these things together. So why is it important? And I think, you know, we're at this critical juncture where why it's important is because, you know, the, the world is changing in a way that's open to that. And I see that in the world, but I see it when I look out into the world of my students. And I feel the sort of the reception and the hunger for knowing more about that and, and what that does. And so we have to sort of prepare ourselves for that. And Rebecca also has served on sort of many committees that are about diversity and LGBTQ and, and uh, you know, sort, sort of other things. And we consider that to be important work, but we're also frustrated and troubled by the way it's under-resourced. Um, so that in um, the first year, I think it maybe even in the second year where I began to just sort of openly introduce sort of gender theory and feminist theory and striding in and talking about games and media and other things to the games course, I was not prepared for some of the hostility that I was getting back from the students who, who felt like I was being personally critical of their world and their, their games and their, their uh, you know, something that I didn't know enough about and that I, I, I didn't have a perspective that was open to that. And I actually had somebody stand up in a lecture hall like this and just angrily, literally the classical shaking of the fist and called me a feminazi. I was a feminazi for bringing up issues and I, you know, I, they might not be wrong, but um, that is in some ways a way that, you know, I was sort of shocked by the reaction, but then I was also shocked by the way there was this rallying around of, you can't say that, you can do this, other dialogues and things. But over the years, it's just been a, like we're all nodding our heads together when I bring up the troubles. And we're, we're all there, we're coming together, and I think people are hungering for more. Um, but I don't know how we're going to how we're, well, I do, I have suggestions for how we're going to get more, so we're going to get there. So I, I would say, and Rebecca and I would say, well, our labor is often assumed um, that we can carry that load, um, and we're happy to carry it to a degree. Uh, we also um, sort of feel it's important to try to make a difference and to do our part and all of that together, but it's never fully valued. Um, it's evidenced by the way in which it's just chronically under-resourced and not fully integrated within a full curriculum where we can't find where it's not sort of important enough or where it's not staffed enough or where people are not trained enough to continue the trajectory of these important themes throughout um, the curricula. So given this lack of sustainability, um, you know, our labor is just basically not effective in the ways that we intend. So... Um, Often then our fixes only 
sort of serve to affix us in these positions and a broken system. And then we feel that we're just further reinforcing so we can say that we're doing it. We're helping the administration tick some boxes. We're helping the education move forward um, so that we can say that we're open to these ideas and we are open to them, but they don't make the, the full um, difference that they want. Our fixes are diluted until they become kind of just these performative gestures. And that absolves others too of um, the, the need to, to go forward and to take this on. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. And a lot of them, again, as I said, are systemic and training and, and so on. And we'll come back to those. But back to the trouble with games then go deep. Um, and they are embedded and integrated into the entangled configurations comprising games and their worlds um, as games are called into relation by sort of this dominant industrial, cultural, and academic power structure. And again, I'm talking as an educator at a university which has an extremely political organizing structure, which is not a natural necessarily reflection of the world, um, and which is sometimes at odds um, with what we want to say. So given the breadth of these game troubles, um, you know, I'm going to sort of try to more closely examine that. Um, and we're going to try to find new ways to entangle that, and I'll talk about, not in detail, I promise you, um, perspectives like the works of the feminist new materialists, who develop new imaginative models for rethinking the way the world is made and the way the world is built and the way it can be performative and emergent um, and it doesn't necessarily have to fit into a structure that we know um, very well. So it's very um, affectively configured um, and um, we can go to that. But as I said, um, I, um, first of all, does anyone recognize that quote? where it's from. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. It's Shakespeare, it's Macbeth, and it's the witches, uh, the three witches um, who open a sort of Macbeth. And I'm using the cauldron here in a kind of, in a playful way, in a playful space, uh, as a kind of a playful, what I will call as an apparatus for thinking. Um, as a metaphorical, allegorical sense, sort of in the way, if you know, if I just digress for a moment to the witches in Macbeth, um, y you know, there's the, the classic, the idea, right, of the witches that are hovering over the cauldron, um, boiling up some kind of uh, trouble is just a sort of part of our cultural imaginary. But just point out that in Macbeth, um, one of the things about the witches that is unique is that the, you, the witches don't even speak like the other characters in the play. They're off to the side. They're not of the world in, in a way. Uh, you know, Shakespearean plays use this iambic pentameter verse, but the witches speak in rhyming couplets as a different... So, so even their languages, their rhythms are different than the rest of the natural rhythms of the play. An iambic pentameter as a verse meter is supposed to most clearly mimic the way that natural English is spoken, whether that's true or not. But so, so the, the witches are sort of, they're a forewarning, they're different, they're other, there's something else. Um, but they also have a sort of a magical power of foretelling. Um, they're probably more negative and more dangerous in the context that can be shifted. You know, otherness doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, but in this case, it is shifted. But there is an otherness to them that I love, and I love about the idea of the cauldron, and the cauldron is this kind of boundary object where we can make the magic and where we can make the magic happen. You can see here that this isn't really a cauldron because a cauldron has fire underneath and it's brewing <laughs> something up in the middle. This is just a fire pit. <laughs> that I call my cauldron because it's my cauldron in my backyard. Um, <laughs> it's the cauldron that I, I sit um, in front of on uh, the patio that's by my house in the countryside, just outside of Huvda, in a little village called Lerdala, um, wearing my resting witch face um, t-shirt. And it's become, for me, I mean, of course it's an allegorical object and it carries all the witchy, uh, for good and bad connotations that it has, but it's literally become, in the, in the sort of, in the world of the pandemic, a place for me to contemplate and to, to think about change. We all know that magic of looking in the fire and the way it just brings us to a place. It's like that breathing exercise, right? The magic, the things that you see in the fire. And I spent the pandemic, I spent you know, nearly two years of the pandemic by myself living out in the countryside. I live by myself, um, well, except for my three cats. 
um, the best cats in the world, and um, I will fight you for that, even if you want to tell me about how great your cats are, um, and um, I will tell you why mine are probably better. And if you have dogs, you probably don't want to talk to me. <laughs> um, but, but it was, uh, you know, a, a, again, a, a, it wasn't just the cauldron, it was this, the, the, the cauldron became an apparatus of contemplation, but it was a place for me to be in the world. You know, when the world was a place I couldn't go to, my patio, or as I call it, my catio, because I'm so clever, um, my, my catio was a place where I could go out and breathe in the world and be in the space and try to use it as a place to kind of calm myself down and to think about what was going to happen and to confront this very material reality of where we are in the world and what's going to happen to us and what's going to happen to me and where am I going to go and am I going to have a job and what's, am I going to have students and am I ever not going to be on Zoom again? Am I ever going to get to be in a space where I can breathe together? So I, I use it as a sort of a, a magical, contemplative, playful allegory, but I also say it's one of those um, spaces or one of these apparatus that I'll come back to that I think can be an imaginative possibility space for us. Um, so even when I sit here in my ugly Crocs and my sweatpants, in my backyard staring into the cauldron, um, it can be a real place of beauty um, and it can function as, a, you know, as something else. So, you know, I, as I said, I, I come back here to this um, state that says we're, we're in trouble. You know, we are in a world of trouble. You recognize this. You know, we've got COVID and we've got climate change coming right behind it. We've got war in our backyards. Um, unfortunately, if you're in America, you have school shootings more than 30 this year and the horror of what has just happened now. Um, the, the move to repeal like Roe v. Wade and then the, the fight on the sort of fundamental human rights of women's bodies and choices and all of that going on. Um, and those of their partners and families. We have Black Lives Matter. We have fights for you know, trans rights and we have rights for inclusion and diversity across lots of other spaces. You know, and I could go on and as I said, if I gave you five seconds, you could probably list off 10 more. So I don't want to underestimate the way that I think the world is in trouble, sadly. Um, but even closer to games, um, we feel the pressures from these world troubles that sort of bleed over and they reverberate. They send shockwaves through to our game worlds and our cultures in their own ways. You know, we know we have Me Too, we have, you know, we had Gamergate back when. We have, you know, the current situations of um, sexual and workplace harassment that, you know, we don't have to talk about, but we know are all here. Um, and I don't want to enumerate all the ills, but I do want to say that we, you know, we need to pay attention to them, and you are paying attention to them. You've heard them. You, you, you know they're there. They're in our collective imaginary. You know, they're part of our cauldron experience. Um, and if you don't know them, you're either not paying attention or you're blocking them out. If you want to tell a rosier story, I, I think that's not confronting um, the evidence which is there. But as I said, I know that's also not the end of the story. So uh, these um, troubles have been researched in lots of ways. And again, I, I won't go into the um, detail of how they are, but if you were to read the article, you can see we provided research, for example, like the um, Anti-Defamation um, League report on high levels of you know, hate-based harassment between players within games and the HEVGA, the Higher Education Video Game Alliance, survey of recent graduates, this is from 2019, um, finds that men are satisfied in the games industry following graduation, but women alumni have extremely high industry attrition rates after the first two years of employment. Um, there's been lots of scholarship on Gamergate and sexual harassment and all that stuff. So as I said, we, we know it, it's, it's there. Um, the question is, what do we do about that? Um, and how can we see that again, this games trouble is deeply troubled within, you know, as I said, other world, world troubles, it just manifests itself in a slightly different way. Um, but I would say um, then, um, you know, it can, it can call to us then. It can call to us how to untangle it and to assess it and how to change it and how to innovate it. You know, as I said, it's not the end of the story. So, so this is the challenge for us, how we can move forward and how we can come up with sort of more joyful and more joy-filled experiences with games. It's not the vehicle of the game, 
it's, it's the way in which the game can interact with change, you know, the apparatus of that cauldron, me and the cauldron and the, the material storytelling practices that happen sort of within that. Okay, so that's sort of where I'm heading. If I never get anywhere else, um, I'll, I'll say that. But I want to start, you didn't know I was going to give you a pop quiz. But <laughs> start, start with another quote here. I don't know if anyone recognizes this quote. Maybe not, I think. Um, but I say it because as I said, I was going to say something about myself. So um, this is a quote from a sort of little known work by um, 19th century American writer Edgar Allan Poe, which you probably know, some of you, for his Gothic horror tales. But this is from a different work that was called Eureka. And it was a cosmology. It was intended to be a scientific treatise told in poetic, well, prose poem, kind of content about how the world came into being, how the world was built. It's a world building story about lots of matters and bodies and how they come together and how they converge and it has overtones of sexuality and materiality and spirituality and all of this that comes together and it was a horrifying failure uh, for Poe. Um, but I love the way that he talks about it again as a writer he has no problem, and before the 20th century, 18th, 19th century, no problem trying to say, I'm going to write a scientific discourse on how the world was made, and I'm going to do it with poetry, and, but poetry is true, and science is a thing that can be expressed in poetry. There wasn't this clear artificial separation between the disciplines. And I, I put it here because it really inspired me when I was writing my PhD. Um, I discovered the work, I was fascinated with it. I just, I didn't know how to deal with this work. I wanted to talk about the Gothic tales. And at the time I was studying literature in a um, you know, traditional literature program in an English department. Um, and, I was, and I wanted to write on Poe and the Gothic and female identity and the way female identity represented taboo and all the you know, dead sisters, incestuous sisters who were coming through the attic to reveal all the secrets. All of that was fascinating to me. But I was also fascinated with this very material, scientific poem thing that I couldn't put my finger on and how to write about it. And I really wanted to write about it. And my dissertation advisor, who had been my mentor for many years, was like, mm -mm. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't do that. You'll never get done. There, there's, a, you know, there's a great dissertation, and then there's a done dissertation. And you want to write a done dissertation. I was like, no, I want to be great. I want, to, I want to write a great dissertation. And just kept sort of saying, no, no, no. And I kept bringing in more theories and more things. And it's like, no, 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 no. Stay where you are. And I listened for a while, and I was very uncomfortable with it. And, and then uh, sort of this awful thing happened which is that about halfway through the dissertation process, my um, mentor and my advisor died. She got cancer and got very sick for a year. And during that year, she still wanted to try to work with me and still really encouraging me not to go in the directions I wanted. And it was a very uncomfortable situation. It was a very sad situation. And when, it was, uh, when she finally passed, I ha had uh, this mixed, horrible relationship between thinking, yeah, but now maybe I can... Maybe, because I had to start with a new committee, I had to start over. At the time, I had taken a job working in a technical institution. I moved from an English department into a big engineering institution, Georgia Tech, in Atlanta, and I was teaching in this cultural studies, I was teaching all these engineers, um, and I was very interested in the emergence of digital media and culture and all of that. Anyway, long story short, I changed my tactic altogether. Um, and I decided that the way I had to get my work done, the only way I could do my research, I realized, was to find a way to be true to myself without feeling like I betrayed somebody I respected. And I had to take on a more hands-on, something had to happen, I was stuck in my head, I couldn't get anything done. And eventually, long story short, what I did is I d decided to, instead of writing a, a print dissertation, I created a virtual world. Um, I, in the form of a Gothic castle, which one could go through and explore and encounter paintings on the walls and then hear recordings of parts of my dissertation or go into the basement and discover, you know, texts about, you know, the women and so on. So it was, a, it was an academic exercise. And again, this was in the late 90s, so it's pretty primitive compared to what we could do today. But it was a very real exercise for me in understanding that the only way I could grasp my ideas and grasp the world was to become engaged in them in this sort of performative way that I had to be playful. I had to rip my text apart and put it into hypertext chunks and I had to voice record myself 
telling stories, and I had to learn how to use these software programs in order to do it. And it, for, for me, it became a, a real way of thinking about how to encounter the world. And I will just frame that as saying it's a, it's a material storytelling um, process that I continue to embrace and which I believe and which I hope I, I will be able to get to to, to show you here um, today. But it's also the way that I've continued to do my work, which is to say thinking through problems by doing and by making, by putting myself into a kind of emergent performance with the work that I'm doing by, by again, by, by making, whether these are interactive you know, games or whether they're digital stories or whether they're video or whether they're sound art or video art or whatever they are, it becomes a way, a natural way for me to feel that I can express myself. And it's very similar to my moments of sitting with the cauldron in my backyard and, and being in a present space that helps me to work. So I, I show this picture only because, again, for the article, if I go back to the, the Rebecca and I were working on, it came to life because we spent, um, before, it was about four years ago now, I was trying to recruit her to come as a colleague to Sweden. She was living in upstate New York at the time, and she came to visit me over midsummer while we were trying to strategize how to get her hired. And we were sitting over midsummer in my backyard having a conversation about games and play, and we remembered how much we both, um, or we talked, we didn't remember, we told each other and discovered that we both have this long history with the game cribbage, which I don't know if some of you know, um, but it's a game that I grew up playing, and it was a card game, but that you move pegs around a board, and it had a long um, relationship to my, um, to my grandparents. It turned out Rebecca had that too, and here we were sitting on midsummer, you know, drinking, and saying, oh God, you know, I wish we could play cribbage. How could we, how, do we even remember how to play cribbage? How will we remember how to do that? And what, so we decided the only logical thing to do was to make a cribbage board. <laughs> and then to sit together while making that board remember how to play it. So over the course of the weekend, you know, we got busy in my barn making holes and things, and then Rebecca decorated it, you know, in this kind of beautiful Swedish way, and then we looked up the rules and we played together, and it became, a, a, you know, again, a really fun way to think about how games and play work. Um, and it's a, another kind of framing device, as I said, for how I work. Okay, so now I get back to sort of more straightforward thinking, uh, again, about where I come from. So this is just a little snapshot of um, some of the games education that we have at the University of Huvda, and I've showed this slide sort of here before. And I show it only to say that um, what I like about, because when I get critical about teaching and education, but what I like is the, the diversity of the kinds of programs that we have. You know, we, we don't just have one kind of, you know, game design or game development program. We have multiple at the masters, at the, you know, and each of them is its own individual program, which feels, again, like a way to say, you know, games are more than, and the education of games requires more than, and they keep building, and they keep being spaces where we can teach. I put in green the ones that I've sort of been more involved in. Um, but it also firmly helps me remember that, you know, again, games as media objects are complex. They're complex media objects. There's so many inroads to thinking about what they are and how you can approach them. And so when we think about training or educating people and doing research in games, it requires, again, we can't simplify it. That's why they're in trouble. <laughs> That's why we're in trouble. That's why it's troubling. Because how and from what, uh, what, what context do we, do we teach them in? And how will we, uh, you know, to, to work to make that a valuable um, skill um, later on, or do we want to do that? Um, so I've been, um, I just show down here this game research group. Um, I used to be the leader of a group that was called the MTEC group, which was media technology and culture. Long political discussion over the last two years in order to foreground games to connect it better to our education. We changed the name of the research group, but only under my assistant, insistence rather, that if we we're gonna call ourselves the game research group, it meant games, art, media experience, because I still don't want to shortcut what we mean when we talk about a game, and we talk about how troubling they are. So I've been part of also then starting this new initiative, which I don't have time to talk about, but you can ask me later about Sweden Game Lab, which is more than our research group, which is a way to think about our external, internal partners and education and so on, so that we can begin to really put a hyper-focus on what we mean when we say we're games educators, game students, game researchers, and we're a university education, how that comes together. Um, okay, so that shows the complexity of games. Games are troubled. 
They need material sort of storytelling. I'll, I'll digress again, because that's what I do, and give you another, um, another thing to think about. And that is, um, I'm inspired very much, um, just like my cauldron framing, by other kinds of media objects to, think of, to help me think through games and to help me think through storytelling. So for example, this is a page from a medieval um, bestiary. If any of you know what a bestiary is, it's sort of a, mat it's a book with a kind of a magical collection of, of beasts. Um, it's magical in the sense it's often focused on real animals that live in the world. They have stories attached to them, but they're very allegorical stories, and sometimes they have a very sort of Christian allegorical kind of influence. Um, and they, uh, what I like about it is, like my, my um, Poe thing, the science and poetry and truth kind of coming together, what I like about this kind of bestiary focus is there is no problem with putting important actual Christian allegory along with fantastical, magical things that sort of exist or don't exist or halfway exist. So that, for example, you can get a creature like this. I don't know if you... Something that looks semi-familiar um, that has an allegory attached to it. So it's something, again, a thing that you kind of recognize that's playful and fun, but you don't really know. In this case, it's a leopard. Um, a male leopard, I think we can agree. Um, <laughs> somewhere in there. Um, but but the, inside these serious stories, again, these decorated, beautiful, illuminated manuscripts that are art forms in and of themselves that are meant to teach and meant to socialize, inside there were these, again, this mix of sort of science and truth, but even more fantastical, kind of playful Easter egg characters. So that this, for example, is the Bonicon, which is, doesn't exist as a creature, which is wildly made up, but was very popular in the bestiary. And he's a beast that is a terrible hunter because of his turned-in horns. You can see there he, doesn't he can't fight with his horns. He has no defense, so he's, he could easily be caught. But his um, defense is that he can expel a lot of gas uh, <laughs> to, d <laughs> to get rid of his, and fecal matter actually, depending on which Bonacon you're looking at, to get rid of his enemies. And this was sort of considered like in, in the midst of important Christian allegory, there's this fun little kind of playful spot of the Bonacon. And I like to remember the Bonacon as also a way to say, let's remember how we can find the joy and the fun when we think about the games, art, media experience, and the idea of you know, these deep transmedialities, how games are so many things. They're the world, they're media, they're politics, they're culture, they're social, they cross all of these borders together. That they're, but they have a magical sense of play, and how can we discover that play? And again, I think Alan did that. How can we be the beast? How can we be the Bonacon? And how can we go forward, um, again, to remember sort of all the troubles we have. So these are my sort of inspirations um, for, for thinking about that. Be the trouble, find the cauldron. Um, I draw on, um, again, this kind of framework, and I think it can help us think, think through this. Um, Donna Haraway is um, one of my inspirations, and um, her uh, more recent book, Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin in the Thulacine from 2016, um, she talks about, I, I love this phrase, it's a, it's a magical, playful phrase to me, and one that I think we as creators, developers, designers, researchers, educators can remember. Again, think of me in the cauldron and the material storytelling, the thing that emerges within that. Um, but this almost Dr. Seuss-like phrase, it matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what, ki what knots, not knots, what thoughts think thoughts, what descriptions describe descriptions, what ties tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds and what worlds make stories. I mean, that is, again, about the materiality. If you come from the world, the materials in the world inform what you make. And that can be a good thing, and it can be a bad thing. But we have to be conscious of where we've drawn our boundaries together. Um, oh, interesting. <laughs> Um, and where they can lead us to, uh, you know, and where they can lead us, you know, into this material place. How do we tell our stories? So, um, um, staying with the trouble, thinking through the trouble. Um, Donna Haraway also talks about the fact, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to read on my screen here. I have to read the big one. Um, 
again, that, so she, she talks about, you know, again, the aim is not that we live in a world, begins her book, and she's talking about the age of sort of, it's pre-pandemic even, the age of the, the Anthropocene, which is the age where humans have, the geological epoch where humans have actually changed the actual geological atmospheric forces of the earth, where the impact on the earth from human intervention is there in a way that has never been there before. I mean, it's saying in this world that's falling apart, in a world where humans are sort of destroying it and of themselves, how can we save ourselves and how can we come out of that? Um, and her idea, her, her framework between this material storytelling is to say we have to stay with the trouble. We can't run from it. We can't say games are not trouble or they're trouble sometimes, but they're not here. How can we stay with it? How can we face it um, and see that it can be a generative foundation for new discovery? So she says that the world building that we're in now, is, she calls Terapolis. And I'd like to think of that as, as us now, sort of in this place of Terapolis, um, that it's an is described in her words as an n-dimensional niche space for multi-species becoming with. Terapolis is open, worldly, indeterminate, and polytemporal. Terapolis is a chimera of materials, language, is, and histories. So if we can stay in that world where we don't think past, present, future, where we can be more forward thinking, we can be open and indeterminate and we can't seek for truths that we already know, but we look for discovery, um, then we can find our sort of new place. And in particular, um, and this is where I, I um, would like to think about that, we can um, have these very, as she calls them, speculative fabulations. We can feel free to dream um, which doesn't mean that, that, that they're going to be different from the actual reality and the realisms within that. But we have to find a way to project ourselves out of what we know. We can't depend on the stories, the tales, the meanings that we have. We have to leave everything behind us, including our sense of our own identities and being and who we are as university members and teachers and so on. And we have to go forward from that. Um, and I'm going to get to, to how we can do that in a moment. I'm also then, uh, and again, I don't have um, time. I can see my time is you know, already, I'm going to be long. Uh, <laughs> but it's OK, because I'm going to get to good stuff. I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of slides for you in a minute. Uh, do what? No lunch. <laughs> no lunch for you, right. We're staying all day. Welcome to Terapolis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, so, and again, I won't go into the details of this, but I have to mention the name and the title, but Karen Barad talks about this system that I think can help drive us through thinking about games. Um, Karen Barad is a physicist, but she's also a feminist and um, somebody who offers a critique of science. And one of the ways that she critiques the notion of the world and how it kind of comes into being is saying that we have to you know, we have to shake it up. We can't go into the world looking for knowledge we already have. We can't, we can't be there to reinforce what we know. We have to do the impossible, which is to say, find that which we don't know at all, which we don't know the boundaries of and which we can't see. Um, we have to enact a place where we, we, we have to do things, like we have to make games, we have to tell stories, we have to make them, we have to make a kind of a cut into the world and, and tell them but we have to keep breaking our frames when we do it. We, we, it's too easy to depend on retellings. How can we make something new? How can we innovate? And how can we, we, we be aware of the systems that sort of do that? So again, I just want to say that the book is um, Meeting the Universe Halfway. And I love this quote from this poem, um, uh, which is where the title is coming from. And again, I have to read it off the screen this way because it's too hard to see. But j just let me sort of read this and let this... Um, because truths we don't suspect have a hard time making themselves felt as when 13 species of whiptail lizards composed entirely of females stay undiscovered due to bias against such things existing. We have to meet the universe halfway. Nothing will unfold for us unless we move toward what looks to us like nothing. Faith is a cascade. And I, and I take that. Again, we're not going to see the lizards if we don't know what we're looking for. We can't, what, what do we do with these 13 species of lizards that are all female? We, we don't know how to find them. Somehow that's our aim, is to meet the universe halfway um, and to do that and to become um, um, part of this emergent magical process. Um, and I won't um, spend time on that. I'm happy to sh share slides. 
um, but we have to find a way to be involved in that. We have to be um, part of a, this sort of messy new material framework for emergent w world building. You know, we are going to meet the universe halfway. We're going to work away from what we know and try to place ourselves in the moment of discovery, in the moment of innovation and understanding that. Now, I want to come back to the trouble so that I can finish with some um, speculation here about games, and as I said, games pedagogy. Um, and that means I have to go back um, to my cauldron and I have to remember double, double, boil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. How can we um, think about this in terms of games and the trouble that games are? And how can we think about our role as educators um, to break the mold? Um, part of that, as I said, that process of saying, um, I, you know, I, 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 how do I discover the thing that I don't already know? I'm inspired by, um, you know, pedagogical research and um, pedagogues like Bell Hooks, who recently passed, says the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy, and I believe that. And in this context, Bell Hooks was responding to it as a sort of a black woman teaching who is separating herself also from sort of white feminists and from other critical pedagogy and recognizing herself as having a specific place in the classroom where she had a unique voice to tell. She had a unique story to tell that um, she couldn't draw specifically. There was no one feminist. There is no one radical critical pedagogue, pedagogue uh, teacher. Um, and that, so she told talked a lot about the personal stories that sh she had to share with students and the way she created this possibility space for storytelling in the classroom, where it was important not to teach a curriculum, but to allow people to discover themselves. You know, other people like um, Paolo Freire and his important um, pedagogy of the oppressed, that he um, was also influenced to say, how do I teach, in this case, teaching in Brazil, how do I teach the most illiterate, uneducated people ever? How do I help them come into the world, recognizing that their lack of literacies are also creating barriers that hold them back from participating? How, do I, how can I break a kind of capitalist system and help them to understand um, how to do that? But how do I do it in a way which doesn't just say, come to me and my literacy? Again, how do I meet the universe halfway? How can I um, find a way to teach in a way where I don't know yet what I'm discovering? And how can I avoid what he would call the banking concept of um, education? You know, this one that we recognize where the teacher has the knowledge and is filling up the heads of all the students in the classroom. And then those students are only able to see what the teacher has brought to them. Um, I can only see the orange in the classroom. Um, how can I create a way where, um, you know, again, so now if we come back to games education, so how can we understand, you know, who or what is filling our heads? You know, how can we see who are, are our er, oppressors and who am I oppressing? If I'm standing in a classroom and I'm, and I'm educating, in particular, how can I make sure that I'm not teaching just the status quo? And in particular, how can I make sure... Um, and this is what I address more in the article with Rebecca, is that we're not just becoming a service to the industry, whatever the industry is. And again, that's not a critique of the industry um, as such, but to say, how can we make sure we're not just shifting out a product, but how can we make sure that we're really innovating something, and how can we be aware of how we do that? So I have, you know, just use an example to share, and I could pick anything. Just a quick snapshot, and you'll probably recognize this, but this is like from the games writing curriculum in Huvda, where I am, talking about games pedagogy. Um, and you can see it's sort of the standard way that it works. We do have courses that are semi sort of radical, and this is a revision over the last two years. And again, I understand it as an, a significant, important revision, and I think we have a great, we, you know, we're one of the few games writing programs that exist, so that we can have a course called Moral Philosophy for Game Writing is great, and we have courses in world building and creative writing, you know, but we also have these very project-oriented classes, and we're leading people toward a thesis, and we are directed and guided because we are in the politics of a university system that says, you can only, you know, you have to evaluate certain credits go in some ways. People have to write a thesis project. It has to be framed this way. There are certain courses where multiple students have to come together in projects. They have to make things. That there is something that's very hard to break. Even when we try to radicalize it, we can't get there. Um, and one of the reasons 
just one of the reasons we can't get there. Um, and again, I don't want to, well, I'll just, I will. <laughs> I say one of the reasons we can't get there is this long legacy in the ways that, for example, games have um, been connected to the computer science discipline and it specifically also to, to military sort of technologies. There is a long history, and again, it's not, it, it, it's, a, it's a fact, it's, it, it, and it, it, the, the ramifications of it are still spreading. When we think about the ways that games themselves have been connected to, you know, sort of beginning in some version of military training or, or connected to very colonial prospects of, you know, of, of war and power and strategy and overpowering and shooting and killing and <laughs> dominating, um, and then been repurposed into entertainment. Uh, in many ways, so that, for example, this in the middle, down at the bottom, I can't talk about all of them, but you can read the article and find out. Cinerama, for example, um, Cinerama began as again, it's a, it's a, it's a um, like an immersive um, a sc screen technology, like a cinema, as you could imagine, but much sort of much more curved screen that that began as a kind of um, gunnery training in World War II and after the World War was repatented, repatented, is that a word, and released in a way so that um, it could be commercialized as this new kind of media product that wasn't quite like film, but that wasn't quite like um, play and performance, but that created a kind of immersive experience that we could see as a precursor um, to sort of some of the AR, AI, um, AR, VR sort of stuff that, that we see today. Um, and again, the AI, cave technologies, many of these others, the connections between, again, computer science as a discipline came directly out of military funding and came and, and co-opted computer sort of technologies, eventually games in its early days. And we've been trying, you know, the legacy of that exists in ways that, you know, you know we can't change um, and which I could talk about in terms of my own positioning um, Within, um, uh, within my department in the School of Informatics where I have a subject discipline that's called Media Arts Aesthetics and Narration. There's another subject discipline in the games that's called Informatics. We separate down the lines of these are sort of the technical people, these are the arts and humanities people, but we all try to work together in a team, but there are biases within the systems that privilege one system over the other. Um, and people who claim ownership over, but we are the real games researchers and professionals, and you are the artists and the creatives um, who come within that. So we have to change that. Again, we have to set the world on fire. Um, we have to resist what I call and what Rebecca calls and what others, as I say, the sort of the pipeline curriculum, which is this idea that what a, what a curriculum is supposed to be is a straight, Again, it's a pipeline, right? It's a device that moves things through. Bugs in the system of the pipelines, blockages, things that create a smooth, progressive process are to be resisted. We move to create progressive curricula for students. We move them from where they say, you learn this first and this second and this third, and we're excellent at doing that. And we say, here, are the, you learn this before you learn this, and on you go, and if you don't, you step out, and then you fix it, and then you come back and we progress you through the system and then we pipeline you out into the industry and pipeline you out into the world and we have to make these kind of smooth fixes. Um, and again, it's not our fault <laughs> that we're having to do that, but we wanna know if there's a way to resist that. So our suggestion is, and it's based a lot on this information I've given you before about the new material and new matters of storytelling and how can we tell stories of the world is to say, um, what if we created something called a hive curriculum? A hive, and by a hive, I mean, you know, exactly what you think of as a beehive. Um, and in this case, you know, the bugs are the system. <laughs> they're, they're not the blockage. Um, they have the focus on, not on the game or the object or the output, but rather the students and faculties who co-construct the learning experience. So, so in contrast to the pipeline, the structure of the hive is multidimensional. It offers many pathways through and within, and wherein the pipeline is rigid and resists change, um, this system um, creates it and sustains it and is meant to be made and to be remade and to be rediscovered on an individual process. So it's never really complete. It's always growing. It's a reality um, that, that we keep 
together and where we don't limit games. Remember my games art media experience. We don't limit games to a, a, a simplistic definition. Um, we think of them as of the world and we think of them of the troubles of the world and ones that can trouble the world. So um, this curriculum is um, accessible, um, flexible, co-constructed, um, and it's in opposition and it's a kind of participatory world building. Um, and let's remember the hive has honey. There's a sweetness, there's a reward um, at the end of it. And I, and I remember my speculative fabulation where I say the great thing about speculation um, it's not the end of the story because maybe we can't get there. Maybe it would, maybe, you know, it's an impossibility, but the dreaming and the moving forward to thinking about this, and I know if you look, so this, for example, is a high plan of studies. You can just look at it and imagine. I don't have to go through it in details. I'm sure there are elements in your own games program, as there are in mine, that already exist. Um, but what if we allowed students to pick their own path, like this first year, second year, third year, like what if it was more of a sort of a Montessori world where you discovered things in clusters of years and you worked with people across disciplines and you didn't just limit yourself to thinking about um, sort of, I, I'm learning within my, my, my programming discipline and now I'm learning within my writing discipline. What if we just widen the perspective to have a kind of a worldview um, and what would it mean to teach that? Um, and, uh, and I recognize and we recognize that would mean, again, burning down the system. It would mean setting that cauldron up and, and rethinking about it. It would mean having to rethink who our teachers are and who our educators are. Right now, a university expects us to hire certain kinds of people with certain kinds of credentials that do certain things and then to elevate them within that. And that's the way we get accredited. That's about grades and outcomes, and that's serving the Board of Education. Um, but how would we do that? How, how, how could we, and could we do it and still be a valued education? C could we be part of a, a university? You know, is, is that where we are? Um, and what industry? What if we were putting people out, you know, not servicing a industry, but for example, in the radical entrepreneurship, you know, really thinking about um, how can you do not just service one industry but develop new industries and move toward that. So that's my radical um, pedagogy. That's my dream for the cauldron. Those are the things I think about when I'm sitting by the fire on my catio. Um, and those are my three beautiful cats. Uh, Frida on the left, Greta in the middle. They just had a first birthday yesterday. And then the most important, Siri my digital assistant who doesn't help me at all and anything. And that's it for, for me today. Okay, Lissa, uh, thank you for an amazing talk. This was um, really super interesting. Do we have questions first? Because uh, I certainly have one, but um, I would like to keep it for a second. Thank you. Um, hello. First hello. of all, I would like to thank you for the talk. And my question is mainly about the last part of the talk, about the um, hive education, I suppose we can say. Um, and I wanted to ask, because I didn't understand, is that part of who have the university at the moment, or is that just your dream? And are there any um, concrete things that you are already working on that um, you think will be active maybe in the next few years? Yeah, no, that's certainly not our curriculum. Our curriculum looks much more like the first slide that I showed to you, and it's under revision. And again, the revisions are, are very slow. And, I, and again, I would say, I think we have a very robust education, many dedicated students and teachers and all of that together. But when I started with the sort of troubles in the beginning that say it's not robust enough to address the kind of the world problems. So we are making changes. We are intervening and slowly in the ways that we can. But again, the, the, the problem is just that it's not a problem I can fix <laughs> or that Rebecca can fix or even my department head can fix sometimes because there's systemic problems 
that are rooted in how we think about disciplines, how we think about a proper education, what we think of as belonging to university as opposed to something else, and what is going to, quote unquote, get students' jobs sort of at the end. So it's definitely, as I said, it's a speculative future. It's not what we're doing. We're not even close to thinking about that except sort of in our dreams and in the small ways that we've uh, sort of been able to change and, um, the system that is open to us, but it is very slow to change. Hey. <laughs> it's Phoenix. Oh, hey. Hey. What Where are you? Oh, there you are. So I, I really like this because I've made, I guess, five, um, I guess you would say degrees now in three countries. And I've really thought a lot about this stuff. Um, and I've started, you know, I've found ways to weave in the approach you describe at the end. I've, I've asked us to do more of that. It's, it's an uphill battle both ways in the snow. Um, and what I've kind of, I've kind of fallen on a, a Lord's quote, which is, you know, you'll never, um, let's see, it's, let me see if I can get it out of my head. Um, you can't use the tools of, you know, the master's house to like, it, I, it's, I'm trying to remember the quote, but it's yeah. escaping me right now. Yes, you can't use the master's tool to, what is it? To destroy right the master's house. Yes, yeah. exactly. They can't use the master's. So I've started thinking like, maybe we start looking at alternative education strategies. And I really love like the School of Poetic Computation in New York. I think they're doing some of this. I've been looking at Ma, my friend Rachel's program out in Berlin. She's been doing, or I think they now have been doing some of this. And I'm, I've started thinking like, maybe we start creating systems outside because um, I'm not sure, do you think this is ever possible at the university's level, at the university level, or do we need to like burn that whole thing to the ground? Well, see, the thing is, and again, this is about self-preservation too, right? If we burn it to the ground, where, where am I going? <laughs> I mean, that's the question, And that's the right? problem, like, right? That's how a, do we fit, right? Yeah, how, 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 to, how, how to change it, how to make it. It requires sort of deep commitments that I think are, are slow to come. It comes, first of all, like I would just ask you all as I'm presenting this, and I, I, I know even though I took a long time, I sort of rushed through the pedagogy part of things, that resistance to, to thinking, I don't know, how would that work, or why, or I like my program, <laughs> I like what I used, or I don't find a problem with it, that it's, it's, it's hard to decide sort of who, who needs this and who should do it. And of course you can move something outside alongside, but I believe also um, you, you should be able to change from within, like you shouldn't have to just make an alternative on the side. It should be able to come. But I, as I said, I think for now it comes slowly. But I wonder, but it, it, maybe it comes at least within game, because that's all I can talk about right now, within a games curricular, a games education, with the recognition that we have to be conscious of our own process and what we're making and who we're sending out and where they're going and who's receiving them and what the responsibilities and what the dialogic responsibility between the world and the education, that is a first step. You know, there are so often where I hear from either students or from people who are hiring students that a lot of things we teach them they don't really, they don't care about. They really, like, like you know, do they care whether or not they have, you know, an improvisation background? Well, maybe they do, how to work in a team. But, but there are, you know, there are things where I just feel again, like there's this idea that we want practical skills without creative thinking skills, but then how do we give a real education and how do we create a consciousness that can be serviced? I think it's, so I don't know, that's a no answer to a good question. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I know it's soon lunchtime, but I do have a question and um, yeah, so the, the master's tools in the house, I didn't know that one before. I'm, I'm normally thinking about nobody's going to teach you, would you need to overthrow them? As, as sort of my go-to proverb for that. Um, and I'm not sure if it's true either because I, I mirror sort of your, your perspective here that we have more radical staff than we have students. At least it feels like that sometimes. You feel like there's more radical staff? Yes, I, th I think I have the same sort of impression as you have that, like, yeah, 
we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how to dismantle capitalist hegemony. Um, <laughs> how is that going to give me a job in the games industry? Yeah. Um, right, and it, this is this is a dark place because yeah, I mean, the, I I love your um, your hive. There's a paper that's called Harnessing the Hive. It's about exploiting creative small people on the fringes who are doing cool stuff to then basically integrate them whenever they become profitable into your capitalist extraction. So it's what do you do with the hive? Well, at some point when there's honey, you take it, mm. right? So that that is the shitty part of that. And the game says the war machine, the permanent sort of rolling on thing. So one of the things that I'm trying to add formulate as a question. I, I think this sort of physicality, this ritual is all super interesting to get out there and start thinking anew. But how do you approach the fact that the Cthulhu theme is made by mundane, boring decisions in a boardroom? Right? How do I do ritual and and cauldron and emotional to a little bit of a rise in your inflation rate, which is going to take your house away? Or like a slow disempowerment of workers by not enough growing real wages. You know, like the, the, the mundanity, mon, yeah, boredom of evil and exploitation. How do I get that to be addressable with the witch's ways, I guess? Mm. Ooh. <laughs> That's why I kept it for the last. Now I, you feel me. I, 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 what they say, I need a bigger boat. It's like I need a bigger cauldron <laughs> for that. No, but I mean, I, you know, I, I don't even... I can't take it as a question I can answer, but to say, but that, but that is the question, you know, I, I pose because we're, as I said, we're stuck, we're, we're, you know, we're in this capitalist system and this political framework where we can't, that's why I say games are trouble because the world is, is trouble and it's a series of dismantling and it's, there are practical issues, you know, we need jobs, we have to work. Um, but I think, as I said, even just an openness, a responsiveness to saying this is an important question. I feel it with, you know, you say your, your um, colleagues are more radical, maybe. Um, maybe that's true with me, some for sure and some not. But I, f I feel over the last three years the radicalism in the students, too, that I'm, I'm loving the energy that comes through that is also like, yeah, Burn it down. We're going to do our own thing. You know, we don't want to just do the same old, same old. But we do want a job. Um, but they, you know, they, but th those are not necessarily opposing principles. I don't think. Thank you so much for your talk, uh, Doris. Um, but yeah, this was already super. I want to work with you on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'm trying to keep this short. I think there is <clears throat> a little bit of a a drinking of the Kool-Aid on both sides then, because we also want degrees. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just that we want jobs yeah. within safe structures, we also want degrees and we buy into that these degrees matter. Or we would just do what Martin Shaw does and move into a tent in England and yeah. have the school of myth and get people to come out there and, and do workshops and they don't get degrees or yeah. certificates because fuck them, right? It's, it's what you take away from this. So how can we, like, <laughs> how can we be bold and courageous and do it? We are stuck because we, in a way, really care for our safety. But, but, and as I said, and I totally agree, and that's what I mean, we're stuck in this, I am part of that system. I'm very aware of my placement in a hierarchical system that rewarded me. But I, I used that example at the beginning. I was the first student at my university in 1999 to submit a dissertation that wasn't a paper dissertation. That I got special dispensation from all the higher ups, including going beyond the university to say that I could be conferred a degree by submitting a, a, a virtual tool with no paper counterpart. Up to then, the only thing they were allowing is you could get a PDF, you know, <laughs> this is when like the PDF was considered. And to say, no, it was like, you know, I got the special, to say, no, this is an academic it's an, you can get a PhD making this, it's still academic, even though at the very end they asked me if there's any way I could print it out and how many pages was it. And I was like, oh. But, you know, it's, it's started. And I'm not saying I'm such an innovator. There are other people making, you know, it's those small, it's the ask. It's trying. It's trying to say, can we just open the door a little bit and shift what a degree means? Can we open it and shift what a thesis means? Can we open it and shift what it says to evaluate? Like, do I have to write 
an evaluation that looks like this. Can I, can I have a, some, something else? So small, but I agree, it's, it's the big challenge. It's not just a job, it's a degree. Hello, I'm Tom. Uh, not the cool one who's talking tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I have a question about uh, the cauldron. Uh, is it like your f source of motivation for li like your projects? Is it a source of motivation? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I think what I try to say when I'm talking about the cauldron is I'm being a bit playful with the idea of the magic, of saying that it's a place of contemplation. The cauldron is a place where you can go, where you can imagine and envision you can dream, right? It's like, <laughs> the, you can dream, but it's not, but it's a real material experience. You know, it, it can't be a fantasy that's of the future. It exists, you know, my cauldron dreaming over the pandemic of all the things that I was doing was an actual real need for me to be like outside and in the weather and in the world and feeling that I was a part of something that I, I, I could think about. So I, I think what I like about the cauldron, it's subversive. It's, again, it plays with the witchiness, with the sort of the otherness. It plays with a kind of an alternative strategy, which doesn't necessarily embrace everything sort of negative and evil, but like those three witches in Macbeth that speak in rhyming couplets, it offers a new language. It offers a new something, and it can be inspirational. Unfortunately, it didn't work out so well for Macbeth, but <laughs> maybe we can, maybe we can do, do better with that. So, Thank you. Thank you so much. This was an awesome discussion, and I think this was really nourishing, but now it's lunchtime. Thank you so much, Lisa, and let's give her a hand.